Okay, thank you for joining us. Okay, uh, so everyone, today we're pleased to have Mr. Spike Cohen on for an individualism AMA. Uh, most of you do know who Spike Cohen is. He's pretty, pretty well in, uh, infamous within the community. Um, and for the ones who don't know, I'll do some background. So Spike Cohen is an American activist and mostly known for his libertarian views as well as libertarian activist progression. In 2020, Spike was the Libertarian Party vice presidential candidate alongside Joe Jorgensen, who was the presidential candidate for the LP. Although ultimately they fell short, they both had massively helped the party getting the Libertarian message out there. Uh, other things Spike is known for is that when he was young, he was extremely well, uh, uh, very successful in web design and overall uh, technology. And then later on, he actually did devote himself to pushing Libertarianism. He had helped found the libertarian media site Muddied Waters, in which he has several podcasts. I know you're in two of them. Um, I'm in two of them. We have we have quite a few podcasts on that yes. every week. Yes, and they're all great. All of you guys should check them out. I've actually seen quite a few of them. They're very good, um, very interesting, and they uh, very insightful. So, with that being said, I think we can get along here now. Awesome. All right. So the first question is going to come from our user Komodo Dragon. He's saying, <laughs> uh, one of the people wants to know uh, who's your favorite current foreign leader. Gosh, um, obviously, there's uh, that's a tough one because I don't really like any of them. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess, uh, gosh, the president of some small country that leaves everyone else alone. I'm trying to. I guess whoever is in charge of Switzerland right now, maybe. I, I guess whoever is in charge of some small, largely inconsequential country who just leaves everyone alone for the most part, if for no other reason than they don't have the, the means to try to uh, enforce their will on others. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one example would be Lithuania. Uh, they, sure. they do pretty good stuff like that. <laughs> sure. Yes. Yeah. So Lithuania, uh, I don't know, like, uh, 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 we'll go with Lithuania. Lithuania, awesome. uh, Switzerland, um, some small and largely inconsequential to the to the world stage country that leaves uh, other countries alone and for the most part leaves their own citizens alone as well. Awesome. Um, all right. Uh, and the next question we have is from a person that wants to know if you could make one policy right now, what would it be? You know, and he gave some examples like abolishing the flat, the Fed, repealing any gun control laws, EDC, anything yeah. like that. He, he started off with the one. If I could pick one thing that would have to happen, it would be ending the Federal Reserve and getting the government out of currency altogether. Because if you look at the reason that libertarians get so wide eyed when we talk about ending the Fed is because it's not just about inflation. It's not just about how controlling currency leads to inflation because they just keep printing out more money and handing it off to their to their the crony corporations that put them in office and sticking mm -hmm. us with the bill for it but it also mm -hmm. ends debt spending mm. it also ends the cronyism all the lobbying that we see where these major corporations come to dc and to mm. your, your state capitals for that matter too and push for more and more spending more and more stuff more and more right. regulations all of that comes from the fact that your government can just print out endless amounts of money and doesn't have to demonstrate to you any real value in exchange for that. They don't even have to tax you. They can just print out money and steal from you by taking away the value of the currency that right. you already have. You know, people are working every day, uh, work hard to get crumbs of the currency that the government turns around and prints out trillions of to hand off to the, the the people that put them in office. It ends the wars overseas because there'd be no way they'd be able to uh, try to get us to pay the kind of taxes in terms of what it actually costs to do those wars. Uh, and it would end the main reason for the wars in the first place, which is to topple any government that doesn't hold U.S. Federal Reserve notes as their world as their reserve currency. So all of these things combined, there's just a countless reasons uh, that ending the Fed uh, would just would end all or most of the the bad things that we're seeing happen from government. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I would have to definitely agree. Yeah, I, I would say probably the big one right now is the Fed. Now that's also the hardest single one. Back in reality, by the time we reach a point where we have the the political wherewithal to actually end the Fed or or even audit the Fed for that matter, um, to show people just how bad it is. 
um, we will have already accomplished quite a bit. We will have already had to grow quite a bit as a party and as a movement. But no, magic, you know, magic world, I could press a button and one policy goes away, ending the Fed. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. Right. No, yeah, it's definitely going to be something that's very uh, strenuous and over a long period of time. Yep. All right. Uh, next question is going to be, so this is about a current event right now, and everybody's been talking about this, every news and media station. Do you think Russia is about to go to war with Ukraine? I don't believe so. I don't, I can't say for certain that they're not. Uh, I know things have changed a lot in the last 24 hours with uh, Putin um, uh, accusing uh, Ukrainian troops of, of uh, invading. Um, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I still don't think so um, because I think that the political cost of invading the Ukraine is higher than uh, the, the political cost of not doing so. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, Putin is doing a lot of agitation to mm -hmm. try to uh, jockey for as uh, much concessions for his side as he can, which is how statecraft works and how political gamesmanship works. Um, but I don't think it's going to happen. But more importantly, it's none of our business which way it happens. Um, and, and part of the reason that it's of such consequence to us, even though it's literally happening 10,000 miles away, uh, is because of a series of entangling alliances, mm -hmm. uh, including in NATO that the U.S. government has. Uh, U.S. troops uh, don't sign up to protect Ukraine or NATO right. or you know, any of these other countries. U.S. troops sign up to protect and defend the Constitution and the American people against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And right. then they are sent overseas by our domestic enemies to fight and kill and potentially die on behalf of weapons contractors, central bankers, foreign dictators, terrorist groups, pederast, drug cartels, the worst people on earth. Right. And that needs to end. It's, it, we are not making anyone safer. We are not making ourselves safer, certainly. All we're doing is wasting lives and money and goodwill and our own safety in the process. Not, the only people that win are all the bad guys and it needs to end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have to definitely agree with all that. You know, it's, uh, you know, obviously a lot of people would probably assume that, you know, you're completely uh, isolationist, I would assume, but I don't think that's what exactly you're saying. This false binary that you either have to invade every country that, you know, looks at you wrong or you have to isolate yourself from the t entire world. I mean, that would be like saying that you either have to go around to all of your neighbors and point a gun at them and threaten them to do whatever you tell them to or you'll kill them right, right now. Or you have to just never talk to them and, and shut yourself in and never engage with them. That's BS. That's garbage. Right. That's nonsense. The, the alternative, the real alternative is to just be a neighbor. The alternative mm -hmm. is to have trade with anyone who wants it, to have good diplomatic relations with anyone who wants it, to not threaten to invade countries that pose no threat to you, uh, mm -hmm. to not use the CIA to create terrorist groups <laughs> and then use the existence of those groups as a pretext to invade the country that you've planted them in. Like th that is the alternative is being a neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, uh, trade and good relations to all who want it and war only against those who are directly threatening us. And, and if we did that, then we would be safer, we would be freer, we would be more prosperous, and we'd have thousands more of our of our loved ones still here with us. Mm -hmm. I want to do a not follow to mention the oh, not to yeah. mention the millions of people being yeah. killed in other countries as well. Right. I want to do a follow up to that, and this is from you know me. Yeah. I want to personally know uh, because you you mentioned uh, trade and cooperation, which obviously you know as me, I definitely agree with. Um, however, mm -hmm. I still hear and see certain people um, on the right wing who advocate for capitalism, who are still very much against free trade. What would you say to those people? Well, what we have right now is not free trade. And, right. and what, they, what they're against is what we have right now. And what we have right now is an environment in which corporations have created a massive regulatory burden on anyone who tries to do business in this country. Mm -hmm. And that was, to, 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 that was intended to eliminate their smaller competitors. Mm -hmm. It was intended that it would eventually become so high, that burden would become so high, that even for them, it's unaffordable for them to effectively do business and compete on the world stage here. Right. They were okay with that because they always intended to leave here and to take their jobs with them and to set up, uh, you know, sweatshop 
slave labor relationships with foreign dictatorships and then use the U.S. military, the U.S. Navy, to protect the shipment of their goods back into the U.S. That was always their plan to make to so poison the water here for anyone who would try to do business domestically that they completely shut off all competition. And, and by the way, that's not just happening in the U.S. This is the status quo in the entire developed world. The entire yeah. Western world has so regulated themselves into these companies just moving overseas and doing all their business there and then just importing it back here. That's not free trade. That is a market that is intentionally gamed to help a small handful of corporations. Real mm -hmm. free trade would be eliminating. Oh, and then in addition to all that, before we even get into what real trade is, then the government says, well, that's OK. We'll save you all by implementing these tariffs. Well, all the oh, tariffs man. are are an additional tax on mm -hmm. those imports which you pay, you as the consumer end up paying that tax. So that didn't help anything. All that did was that's now the way for the government to extract the money from you that they no longer got by that business, you know, not being here and being in another country instead. So mm -hmm. you've been screwed out of your job and you've been screwed into paying the additional taxes that were lost by those jobs being moved overseas. You got screwed both ways. Now, here's what free, real free trade is. Eliminating all those tariffs, eliminating all of those burdens for, for trade barriers and everything else, but also eliminating all the uh, regulations, all the regulatory burden that has made it so unaffordable to do business here. You know, a lot of times politicians will say, when we deregulate, jobs will come back. I'm not sure jobs will come back. Better jobs, newer jobs will grow right here. Those jobs can wither on the vine for all I care. Frankly, mm -hmm. a lot of those corporations in a truly competitive, truly free market environment, they die. And they should have died years ago, decades ago in some cases. They've been kept afloat by their relationships with politicians. So you get that out of the way. And again, this is another thing with the Fed. But you get those regulations out of the way. You get rid of that regulatory burden. And now the reality is even with the additional cost of labor and things like that compared to overseas, it's still going to be more efficient to make something 10 miles up the road or five miles up right. the road or even 100 miles up the road than to have something made clear on the other side of the planet and now having to pay for their own security. No longer using the U.S. military to protect uh, shipments of foreign goods back into the U.S. Why? Why is that the military's job? Let them. They want to make money selling us stuff. Great. They can pay for their own security. That. That's. You know. We don't have the military protecting uh, trucks that are shipping goods around the U.S. Why would we use them for goods coming in from other countries? So true free trade is removing all the barriers all the way around and letting the the market truly reign. And in that kind of an environment, we're always going to do better. Right. All right. Thank you, um, Logan. You had a question. Yeah, so um, a few years ago, the event that kind of like introduced me to libertarianism was an AMA on another server with Nick Sarwar. And about mm -hmm. halfway through, you came in and said something about cheesy bread, and he just completely flipped his lid. lid. And I'll probably never forget that. But um, <laughs> a lot has changed since then, obviously. Um, I think you were like uh, running with R Roman Supreme at the time. Yes, yes. Uh, and so what do you think of are you happy that we moved away from Nick Sarwark? And what would you like to see from LP leaders moving forward? So it's funny because Nick is actually a, a friend of mine. Uh, we definitely have some disagreements on the future of the party. Uh, one example I can give is we had a conversation uh, recently when we were at uh, the same event together. Uh, this would have been, gosh, five, six months ago now. And, uh, and we were talking about the vaccine mandates. Um, I think it had just either just been announced that Joe Biden was pursuing vaccine mandates or it was be about to be announced. I think it had just been announced. Um, I don't remember the exact timeline, but uh, it was clear it was going to happen if it hadn't already. And uh, and, you know, I talked about how this was a perfect example of what the Libertarian Party needs to seize upon that, you know, that this is not going to help things. Uh, it's only going to make things worse. It's going to make people lose their jobs. And, and Nick said something along the lines of uh, and, I, and I always hesitate to quote someone when they can't defend themselves. But I, I, I think I'm being pretty accurate in this. And, and Nick, if you're watching this, you can tell me where I was wrong. But basically that we shouldn't uh, that libertarians really shouldn't be talking about the vaccine mandates because that's seen as a right wing issue, that that's seen as something that the Democrats have cor or the Republicans have cornered and made their own. So if we, you know, become, come out as being against the vaccine mandates, uh, then that means that, you know, we'd be seen as just being like the Republicans. And I said, but you could say that about anything. 
you could say that about police brutality. If we come out against police brutality and come up with our actual solutions, not just beating our chest about it, but actually, uh, and, and beating our chest about vaccine mandates or anything else, instead of just coming out and saying, this is bad, we're against it, actually proposing libertarian solutions. If we did that with police brutality, then maybe some people would associate us with Democrats. Maybe that's a reason not to do that. Maybe we shouldn't say that, you know, socialized health care is a bad thing because that'll associate us with the Republicans. Maybe we shouldn't say uh, that, you know, war is is bad because that associates us well it used to associate us with democrats but they like war now so i'm not even <laughs> sure who that would associate us with. that that associates us with the the anti-bush democrats from you know 20 years ago you know we could do this all day long the reality is most things right now are seen within this this false binary of of left versus right uh uh or, or republican versus democrat which is why it is incumbent upon us uh, as libertarians to say the truth and to present an actual common sense solution, pull people out of this endless good cop, bad cop routine between the Republicans and Democrats and show them, yes, this is good or yes, this is bad. And here's an actual solution that makes sense. I think we should be doing that on everything. So that's certainly something uh, that I, I would say I disagree with with Nick on. And, and I would say I also disagree with uh, you know, people in, uh, you know, some of the factions, like, for example, the Mises caucus, there are many people, I'm actually a member of the Mises caucus, but there are some members of the Mises caucus who say that we shouldn't talk about immigration uh, for, or, or, or even I've even had some say that, that we shouldn't talk about drug legalization for similar reasons that Nick is saying we shouldn't talk about vaccine mandates. And I, I just, I disagree with it. I understand the point they're trying to make, but I, I disagree with it. And I think we need to be consistent in presenting the libertarian message on all things uh, and in showing people that there is a completely different way of looking at things, not just this, this Republican versus Democrat way. I said. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so next question we have is going to be, do you think that the Libertarian Party's turn towards progressivism made it seem like a joke to others? Also, what do you think about paleo-libertarianism, such as Hans Hermann Hoppe and Tom Woods? So I don't, th it's weird because I, a progressive libertarian would ask me if I think the reason we did poorly was because we, uh, we moved too far to the right. Um, I, I think that libertarianism is libertarianism. So libertarianism applied to, for example, the gay rights question is that mm -hmm. it's your body, it's your life, it shouldn't be anyone else's business, which mm -hmm. in an environment in which you know, there's still talk about regulating certain things when it comes to gay or trans people or or sexual relationships or whatever is going to uh, be seen possibly as progressive by those who are opponents to it uh, or even those who are proponents to it. It's a perfect example of literally what we were just talking about. You know, there would be people who would hear about my opposition to gun control or libertarians opposition to gun control, to mask mandates, to taxes and regulations and conclude that, oh, well, they're shifting to the right. And then if we start talking about police brutality or immigration or, uh, you know, um, uh, personal bodily autonomy issues, then uh, people, maybe some would conclude, oh, they're shifting to the left. I, I'm not sure that there's been that shift. I can tell you my my uh, presentation, both in terms of the, uh, during the campaign and, and after the campaign has been consistent in that this is the libertarian way of looking at things. You know, and starting from the, the philosophical baseline, since we're talking about Tom Woods and Hans Hermann Hoppe, of self-ownership. You own mm -hmm. yourself. You have bodily autonomy over yourself. And I, I'm not a huge fan of the, the term self-ownership because then that implies that your property, which you're not, or that your ownership could be delegated to someone else if you choose. You have autonomy over yourself at all mm -hmm. times and all things. Um, so ownership is, I guess, the easiest way of describing it. It's, you know, I'm, I'm a nerd, so it's, it's not the cleanest way, but it, I, I, it's close enough uh, that you uh, have autonomy over yourself and your life. And mm -hmm. you're, you have right to, to the autonomy over your speech and your thoughts and your labor. You own your labor. Uh, and certainly that means, of course, that you own the product of your labor, which is your property. Um, I, uh, when it comes to Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, Hoppe uh, when it comes to Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, I will say I haven't read everything he has written, so I'm not going to call myself an expert. Mm -hmm. I do agree with uh, when he talks about what libertarianism could look like in terms of creating these covenant communities um, where there would be people that, you know, if you own this property and other people buy in uh, to it and you have these preconceived rules of how things are going to go. Uh, I don't, I, I, I mean, that lines up with libertarianism. My one question to him 
And I've had people that I've asked people that are that consider themselves, I guess, acolytes or studiers of, of Hoppe. And I've asked them, okay, I, I am inside and, and maybe I may end up having to get the uh, the answer from him because I've had people tell me both yes and no. Mm -hmm. And there cleanly has to be one answer or another. And yeah. my my question to, to Professor Hoppe would be, uh, okay, I have there's a, a, a covenant community and I have bought a, a, a home in that covenant community. And uh, I, you know, I know all the rules ahead of time and I go, okay, no, that makes sense. That, that all works out for me, whatever they are. It doesn't even matter what the rules are. And I go, okay, great. That's, that's fine. And, uh, and I, I, I buy in and now I, I own my piece of property and, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm part of this covenant community. Uh, let's say everyone in that covenant community is now dead. It's been you know, 100, <laughs> 200 years. And we're now, you know, three generations into this covenant community. Uh, and everyone that's there is saying, I don't, or, or a, at least a couple of the people that are there are saying, I don't want to live under this anymore. I, I, I'd like to, uh, to, um, I'd like to, uh, uh, you know, opt out and remove myself from this community. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, is that allowed? Or even if I'm still alive and I say, I, you know, I've decided I'd rather just opt out of this community and take my property that I own with me, is that allowed? And if that's not allowed, and if we have to continue to be bound to, especially for future generations, bound to the will of those who set rules who are no longer with us, then how is that substantively or functionally different than the state? Mm -hmm. um, and so I I've been told, yes, of course, that would be allowed. And then I've been told, no, it wouldn't be allowed because that was a contract. So that how much I would agree or disagree with with uh, Hoppe on the specifically the concept of covenant communities would depend a lot on what level of opt-out is allowed and when uh because it can very mm -hmm. quickly a covenant or an agreement between living people can turn into a state that's being imposed on people by dead people right yeah and i'd like to add like uh i guess another scenario would be what if it was built into the preconditions of the society you know you're not allowed to leave because that's an that's, entirely different question right yes and that's effective here's the thing and it's i would certainly not sign into something like that precisely because that's effectively a state. If right. you have a, if you have a, 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 it's a state that you can opt into or out of, but I'm signing up it theoretically anyway, my kids and their kids and their kids or anyone I sell it to or whatever else into uh, this, this, these are the rules. They are always going to be this way. They cannot be changed and you cannot opt out. I've essentially, for lack of a better word, doomed my kids into being a part of this on their, on our property that we own. I have right. voluntarily subjected future generations, which I would argue is something I don't have the right to do, uh, right. to be imposed, have a, what is effectively a state imposed on them. And if right. you take it to its full conclusion, where let's say six generations from now, everyone living in this community goes, we don't want to, no one wants to live this way anymore, right? <laughs> like whatever that thing is, let's say no one wants to live this way anymore, but that's what the contract says and we have to do it. So then what, everyone abandons their property or only sells it to people that agree with that covenant? I, I, I feel like there has to be some level of opt out mm -hmm. or else it effectively becomes a state. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, in that scenario, if there was an opt out, like where you couldn't even like say sell your property, the only thing would be to surrendering your property to the state at that point and dealing <laughs> property. Exactly. And that would suck. Um, yes. All right. I have a question. Um, so, you know, we all, a lot of libertarians, you know, there's obviously the general term libertarian and everyone can, you know, assume what that means. You know, everyone yeah. has their own depiction of what a libertarian is and what it means. Right. Um, but, you know, each for the most part, a lot of libertarians, uh, they have their own, you know, little sub labels and stuff like that. Obviously, you have anarcho capitalists, you have constitutionalists, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I would myself consider myself a classical liberal, uh, which is okay. more for free markets, but lesser on the state part. Um, so then for you, I'm just curious, what would you if you had a sub label that's not libertarian, what would you classify yourself as? I am an anarcho-capitalist, um, mm -hmm. and that's that's where I fall under. Now, with that said, um, <laughs> I routinely work with constitutionalists, classical liberals, minarchists, um, people that are still figuring out what it is they believe. I work with progressives and conservatives on stuff. Oh yeah, um, uh, you know. I mean, there's there's plenty of things. Uh, last year, I worked with progressives on working to end qualified immunity in Ohio. I worked with mm -hmm. uh, conservatives across the country on Second Amendment sanctuary legislation. Uh, I worked with progressives on getting rid of a really bad snitch incentivizing bill that was being proposed in a county in Florida uh, that they were using abortion as their 
as their pretext for doing it, but ultimately it gave them unlimited authority to pay off snitches and uh, using the court system. And, uh, and, you know, so I, I will work and, and obviously uh, libertarians of every stripe on, on all sorts of things, but personally, I myself am, a, am an anarcho-capitalist. Yeah. Um, okay, so next question. And this is for about like, you know, uh, just overall, um, what steps can young people take right now to promote libertarianism, especially considering the doctrine taught in schools? Because most schools are public. Right. That's a tough one. I, I'm trying to picture when I, cause I was both, I had some years that I was uh, uh, homeschooled and some years that I was in public school. And the one thing that strikes me about my time in public school was I basically went there, did my time and left. I didn't really learn much of anything, especially those last couple of years. I was just doing drugs. I wasn't even paying attention. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm just being perfectly honest guys. Like, I mean, I'm not saying do drugs. You shouldn't do drugs. drugs are bad, but, uh, at that time, I've actually been clean for, for 16 years now. So drugs are bad. Don't do drugs, kids. Uh, <laughs> stay in school. But I will say, when I was in school, it was garbage. I wasn't learning anything. I wasn't being engaged. Right. There were a couple classes where the teachers were really trying to engage with students. I don't even know how that's possible. I mean, this was in the 90s that I went to school. Post No Child Left Behind, I don't even know how that's possible anymore with just the level of standardized testing that's required to even try to effectively teach kids. So from a standpoint of being a kid in that environment, I'm not sure. I don't honestly don't know how much you can do. Uh, I, I guess you know, if you have, if you meet other kids that, uh, and I'm saying kids, you know, if you're, you know, if you're in your teens, I'm, I'm going to be 40 this year. So every everyone's a kid to me. Anyone <laughs> under 25 is instantly a kid. Um, so, but if, you know, if you meet other students that are, uh, you know, saying the same things as you, or, you know, maybe believe agreeing with you on certain things when you're, when you're talking with them in your different social circles, and you want to start like, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, like a libertarian club after school. I've seen that that's happened a few times in a few classes in a few schools where they've done like after class stuff. Um, honestly, I'm not even sure inside of the school environment, especially in a public school. I'm not sure how much you're going to be able to really do. Honestly, I, mm -hmm. I think most of it is going to be outside of school in your social circles. Um, and depending on your age, you know, if you're already 16, 17, 18 years old, you can probably start getting into like local activism, yeah. uh, you know, showing up to council meetings. You know, my version of activism is a lot less protesting and a lot more showing up to meetings mm -hmm. with pieces of paper saying, here is a legislative solution, pass this, agree. or else all these people yeah. sitting here are going to vote against you. Um, I think that's way more effective than oh, yeah. saying I'm angry and here's my sign about why I'm angry. <laughs> right. I, I get it. I've, I've done plenty of sign, plenty of sign waving. I think there's a time and place for it. But like if I were, uh, you know, in my teens and wanting to get involved locally in libertarianism, uh, I would do localized activism, getting involved mm -hmm. with whatever. If someone's fighting a tax increase, if someone's mm -hmm. fighting uh, to, you know, pass uh, some kind of police accountability uh, right. or to, you know, something like that, I'd get involved with that. You guys have the beauty of social media. You guys can, you know, you can get into different social media circles, libertarian circles. You're outside of libertarian social media circles and kind of slowly and deceptively inject libertarian ideas into them and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, it's really, I, I guess the, the short answer is whatever you feel like right. is your best way that for you to try to spread it. Yeah, I would definitely have to agree. I def I really highly, um, and I want to talk to the person who asked the question. I really do agree with him saying uh, going to the meetings, going to your town halls, and this and that instead of you know protesting. Well, because protesting can work. However, it's so much more effective if you just organize you know political activism within the actual legislation. It's far it, it, more protesting. It, protesting has its time and place. Right. Protesting can be a way to demonstrate popular support for or opposition to something, but that's yeah. it. That's yeah. all it can do. Think of, uh, this was before your time. Uh, uh, you may have been alive during this, uh, but if you were, you weren't very old. Uh, mm -hmm. but during the, during the Iraq, the second Iraq war, um, mm -hmm. during the George W. Bush years, there were anti-war protests everywhere in the U S in, in large towns and small towns in the biggest cities, the small, everywhere you went, there was someone holding up a sign saying, I am against this war. And I mean, they were everywhere. And in other countries, they'd have, I mean, you think these protests uh, against the vaccine mandates and lockdowns are big. The anti-war protests were every bit as big, if not bigger. Mm -hmm. And the media was constantly covering them, at least in the U S right. constantly covering anti-war protests, more anti-war protesters, please attack anti-war protesters. That didn't matter. 
The war continued. It didn't affect right. the war effort even remotely at all. In no way did it affect it. What it right. demonstrated was that a bunch of people were against it. And that was it. And where they got effective was when they would start showing up to, uh, uh, and this never fully came to fruition, but there started being threats of having going to state legislatures and pushing for them to pass what we now call defend the guard, which is legislation that forces, uh, requires that the, uh, that the governor can't allow uh, National Guard troops to be sent overseas to fight unless there's a congressional authorization of war. Mm -hmm. um, had that been in place, you could have, especially during that war, which relied so heavily on National Guard units and Air National Guard units, you could have very quickly put that war yeah. to its knees by having even 20 or 30 states pass uh, defend the Guard legislation. Instead, they were outside going, I am against war. Right. See my sign? My sign is also against war. Don't talk to me or my sign ever again. Like it, it didn't, it had its place, but it didn't actually accomplish what it wanted to. Right. And another good example would be the Vietnam War in that regard. The only reason why we pulled out of Vietnam, yes. though, is just because we were losing. It had nothing to do with the fact that basically 97 percent of the U.S. was against the war. Um, yes. Yeah. Anyway. The pro, the pro, yeah. The pro, it, an interesting thing about that was the protests. That was the first time that the American public was exposed to, at least in the modern era, a bunch of people demonstrating popular opposition to something. And, right. and this was pre-internet. So the media was still able to try to sell them all as just a bunch of dead enders and ignore the fact that a lot of them were veterans coming back saying, mm -hmm. I'm against this thing. But that at least opened the consciousness. But yeah, at the end of the day, it came down to uh, politicians realizing this isn't working. It's, it's you know, our, our resources are needed elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Nixon was able to, to capitalize on uh, anti-war sentiment and get elected and change it. So that, that's where it is. Mm -hmm. That's where the power is. Right. All right. Uh, next question is, do you think that the EU is going to dissolve in the next 10 years? If yes, why? If not, why as well? So first, I have to say, I've enjoyed watching Logan looking into whatever this thing is. I, I am waiting for him to tell us if we're over 9,000 yet. Um, I just, I, it's, I love it. Anyway, um, so uh, do I think the EU is going to dissolve in the next 10 years? That's the question. Yeah. So the next question is, do you think the EU is going to dissolve in the next 10 years or if even longer, why basically, or if not? That's a good question. I don't dissolve, probably not. I think it will continue to be smaller and less relevant. The mm -hmm. EU was an attempt it was an attempt to create a UN within just Europe. Mm -hmm. And it, it was not a federalization, you know, where, where each state had a certain level of autonomy under a, 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 a national government type of thing. It was, it was like, okay, you're all going to be separate, ostensibly autonomous governments, uh, but we're going to have a, a, a mostly bureaucrat class make a bunch of decisions for you. Mm -hmm. And it was imposed on a, on a, uh, on a continent that still has very high levels of nationalistic sentiment and and they tried to channel nationalistic sentiment into eurocentric sentiment or what and it just it, it hasn't happened um right. and uh it's it has been a massive burden on them economically except for the major corporations who wanted it because again that's their way of you know muddying the waters for anyone in europe who wants to compete against them so they can go in and set up uh, relationships in foreign countries and ship it all back to Europe. Same thing they're doing here. Um, I don't think they'll dissolve. I think you'll see more and more similar things to Brexit, but maybe less so. Uh, the UK was in a, a, a unique situation in that they still had their own currency. Um, and so it was easier for them to kind of break away and, and from, the, from the, uh, the European Union. And even then they still had problems. I, I think there's going to be a scaling down of exactly what the EU is. And I think you're going to see more uh, balkanization within the different European countries of saying, no, we don't have the same shared goal. We don't have the same economic realities. Uh, I do think it's possible, I don't know within 10 years, but maybe within our generation or maybe within your generation, if not mine, um, that we could see an end to the, the, uh, the Eurozone um, experiment of the actual of the Euro. Uh, all of the argument is towards, you know, there's no reason for Greece to have the same currency as Germany. Like it, it just, the, the economies are completely different. Cost of living is completely different. It's, it's absurd. I mean, you think there's a big difference between, uh, you know, Alabama and New York, 
right? Uh, Greece and Germany, it's not even comparable. So I, I could see that happening in the next 20 or so years. Yeah, I, I would definitely have to uh, agree with that. Um, okay, next question is, since you talked about the Mises caucus, uh, do you think that the Mises caucus will take over the LP? I think it's more likely than not at this point. Um, I, uh, I Obviously, anything could change. Um, but from what I've seen, and I've been to, I think more conventions in person than anyone in the last year. Um, maybe <laughs> right. I, yeah, I'm trying to think, I don't think anyone is, I was at like 30 conventions last year and, wow. uh, and I, zo I, I spoke by zoom call into even a few more than that, but I, but I was actually in person at, at over 25 of them. And, um, uh, so I got to see the dynamics of what was playing out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think it's likely, and, and if it's not, what's almost certain to happen. And I, at this point, I'd say it, it is certain to happen is that the Mises caucus will be the largest single faction represented within the party leadership within the LNC and the, and the party leadership um, if they don't like get a full out majority um, of, of, of the seats and, and all of that. Um, I think it's I think it's very likely. Uh, my uh, I, I have not been pro uh, takeover per se. Uh, I think a lot of changes need to happen. Um, I have not been a fan and, I, and I've been public about this. And I, like I said, I'm in the Mises caucus and I, I don't think that a Mises takeover will be the disaster that anti-Mises people uh, say that it is. I also don't think it'll be our, our saving grace moment that the Mises leadership say it is. I think that it will largely be inconsequential uh, to the fact that 95% of voters don't even consider voting for us because they either haven't heard of us or they think we can't win. And if they have heard of us, they think we can't win. They go, oh, they're one of those third parties. Yeah, they, 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 they can't win. And we have to overcome that. And the only way to overcome that is to give them a buy-in before they have to join the party and start voting for us. They have to have an actual buy-in. And that's where the local activism comes in. That's right. where my main focus is going to be this year. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, bit, a bit of a follow-up to that, because now we're talking about, you know, party politics and stuff like that. Yeah, um, you're pro you're you're most likely very well familiar with Ron Paul. He's mm. he's one of the biggest libertarians of all time, um, yeah. and many people like him because of his very not very simplistic, but you know very broad stroke libertarian, big tent libertarian ideas. Um, however, before being in the uh, Libertarian Party, he was very well known in the Republican Party. Do you think then we should be doing what Ron Paul does and pushing libertarianism through, say, a larger party that would more closely align with our views? Um, and I did ask uh, Michael Humer the same question, um, and he disagreed with it, I believe. Yeah. If so uh, Ron himself uh, came to the conclusion that both the Republican and Democratic parties were were dead and that the the, the notion of using uh, one of the major, one of the two heads of the monster to try to reform it from the inside was was a, an idea that was dead on arrival. I mean, uh, Ron Paul, look at everything that Ron Paul was able to do in just a handful of debates, uh, and then look at what they did to his delegates. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm I'm good friends with the uh, one of the people who was going to be a faithless elector and uh, and vote for Ron Paul as a delegate to the national convention in 20. I believe it was 2012. I don't think that was 08. I think it was 2012. Yeah, it was 2012. And uh, they locked her in a room. Really? They locked her in a room. She couldn't do it. Like huh. th this, this is, and there were many other stories of that. They locked her in a room and they basically made one threat after the next. And, uh, you know, that they will do whatever it takes to keep a Ron Paul or anyone like him uh, from rising up in the ranks. Will Not they the let you do something at the local level? Yeah, the, exactly. The establishment. They'll let you do something at the local level. They might even let you be a, you know, a cantankerous truth speaker <laughs> in a single congressional race, <laughs> in a single congressional seat. But when it comes to actually like making effective change, they were fine with Ron Paul doing what he did in his one of 435 seats in uh, the House of Representatives. But president or even uh, look at what they've made Ron pa Rand Paul go through in the Senate uh, to be oh, able to yeah. keep his seat. I mean, it's 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 I don't think it's going to happen. And here's why. The Democratic and Republican parties are part of the same organization at this point. And even if they have different heads, you know, it's like any other large organization. There's multiple umbrella groups within that or there's multiple groups within that larger umbrella. They may even be in competition to some extent. But when it comes to 
endlessly growing the debt, when it comes to endlessly inflating our currency, when it comes to endlessly handing off trillions of dollars to the corporate cronies who put both of their parties in office, when it comes to increasingly tightening the grip on the ballot so that it's harder and harder for anyone but a Republican or Democrat to even right. be on the ballot, to constantly rob American voters of having another uh, viable choice, they work together hand in hand. They're kissing cousins. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, at, at this point, I don't see either party as being an effective long-term strategy to try to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to try to grow liberty within one of them. Now, with that said, if you're, a, you know, you're running for a local office, I had someone come up to me at, a, at an event. I'm trying to remember which one. Anyway, it was at an event and she said, I'm running for school board. I'm a well-known libertarian. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I think she, I think she was even like an anarchist, but she said, I'm a well-known libertarian <laughs> and the local Republican party has offered to spend, I think it was $5,000 or 3000, whatever, more than enough to run a, to win a school board race in a, a suburban mm -hmm. town and, and, and put everything behind me. And it's, it's even a nonpartisan race. So even though there's going to be, you know, basically they're going to add me to a slate of people that they tell the vote for on the ballot. And there will be a, you know, a Republican elephant there on the, on the thing. Um, uh, but they're not asking me to change anything. Uh, and uh, they've asked me to come to a few meetings and speak. Uh, but I'm not even technically going to have an R next to my name. It's a nonpartisan race. What do you think? I said, take it. Like, I mean, if they're truly not making you change anything, what am I going to tell you? No, don't take that money or that support. <laughs> don't you let them tell people to vote for you. How dare you? So, I, you know, I think electoral, whatever your strategy is inside of which whichever party or completely outside of electoral politics at all, whatever your goal is to spread liberty, do it. I, who am I to tell you what it, what it is you're going to do or not do? You know far better than me the best mm -hmm. way that you're going to spread liberty. I will tell you personally. I just I don't I don't think the strategy of you know the 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 uh, change the Republican Party from the inside. If Ron Paul uh, wasn't going to be able to do it, I, I don't see how I'm going to be able to do it. And I and and frankly, I I would much rather grow something completely new outside of that and not be beholden to. Uh, you know, what they had to be beholden to, to grow their, uh, their respective parties and their, their sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, political polarization only works for the both of them. So why not keep yes. doing it? That's, that's what I say. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Also, especially when people are getting so sick of polarization, even as they say those brain dead Democrats and those <laughs> racist Republicans, but then they'll turn around and say, I am sick of the political polarization to which I right. want to say, that's great. You first. But anyway, uh, the, the, the overall sentiment in this country is that they're sick of political polarization. Well, that's the name of the game for the Republican and Democrat parties. They have to use political polarization because if they didn't keep everyone polarized in these endless culture wars on every single issue, they'd have to talk about the fact that they're working together to rob us blind every day. <laughs> so they right. have to keep us at each other's throats so that we don't take a step back and go, wait a second, you guys are being sponsored by the same cronies. And then you work together and you you do stimulus spending and you give us a few hundred bucks and then you give them trillions of dollars and you stick us with the bill for the whole thing. And the cost of living is going up because half of it was done with with uh, with you know uh, Federal Reserve notes being spread. Right. Uh, you know, how, how does that help me? So no, political polarization, we're the cure to political polarization by saying, listen, Absolutely. they're all liars. This whole system is a lie. It's not red versus blue it's us versus them and mm -hmm. them is this tiny tiny group of incredibly powerful and cynical people and they only exist only your continued devotion to them only you allowing them to continue to con you allows right. them to continue to con you the second we give up on that the second we say no more of that they lose mm -hmm. all of their power and I, I find it ironic um one one reason why people liked donald trump so much was because he seemed like an outsider he spoke his mind everything but i don't think people realize just how much of an insider he really is i don't think there's more of an insider than donald trump realistically speaking he talked about being an insider and the deals <laughs> he would make and everything else and it, it amazed me that he was able to but this is i mean that's donald trump's mo right sell right. someone on this project this idea that's going to be the best thing ever and i've got the best people behind it exactly. and it's going to be the best thing that's ever happened and make these the deal. huge promises yes art of the deal yeah yeah he and talks then about when it, it when inevitably it falls apart because you made promises you could not keep, it's this person's fault and that person's fault and everyone was against me. And I, it was, I was the only blameless person and walk away with whatever money is left. That's what right. he's done with countless casinos. That's what he did with Trump stakes and Trump university and Trump Jeez. water and all these other things. And now he has 
Trump White House. And it was literally the exact same thing. It's going to be the best thing ever. We're going to do so many things. It's all these people. So all these people that I just called the best people ever. They're all idiots. They were all against me. Everyone's <laughs> against me. Uh, only I was doing the right thing. And, right. Uh, and you know, come join my new social media group. I, it's, it's, I, yeah, it, it, I, I saw that coming in 2015. I'm like, he's going to get you emotionally invested either for it or against it. He's going to play you against each other and he's probably going to win. And then uh, however many years it takes for it to crumble, uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be everyone's fault, but him. So that's what happened. Right. Um, this is a simple one. Uh, what's your pick? Cause we already talked about Hans Hermann Hopp. Um, and you said you were a fan of him, but you were a little, con uh, not confused, but you had a question about his covenant communities. Clarification. Um, yeah. Right. So then what is your opinion on Rothbard? I agree with almost everything that Murray Rothbard has ever uh, written or said. In fact, I would say if I had to pick one single person uh, whose writings and ideas have most influenced uh, my own ideas, it would be Murray Rothbard. Um, I do not agree with what they call late Rothbard, which is when he kind of decided that the he kind of went with the you know the Republican strategy and he came up with this. Uh, it's been called the, uh, the the paleo strategy or the right strategy. It's been called a few different things. And um, it was basically, yeah, we're going to work with Republicans and their uh, and basically their hatred of certain groups of people. We're going to convince them that libertarianism eliminates their enemies, for lack of a better word. Uh, and then we're going to ride that to victory. And that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and what it did was uh, it's still to this day, you know, we have uh, people talking about uh, one of, uh, I guess, late Rothbard, one of Rothbard's later quotes uh, was talking about unleashing the police on mm -hmm. uh, on 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 anything from in that point he was talking about unleashing it on uh, on homeless people um but all but but unleash the police effectively became his idea use the state as a uh, as a you know an enforcement mechanism uh, against our political opponents against those that we don't like against those that we perceive to be a threat to us well that's what every tyrant calls for like that's right. you know we're you know uh, uh, Marxism calls eventually for a stateless society where we no longer need powerful people telling us how to live our lives. But first, we have to use the state to kill <laughs> all of those bad people and anyone who profited even remotely from the system because they're the bourgeoisie. And then anyone who says that they'd like to be able to keep their own stuff, they're bad too. They just they're petty bourgeoisie. And then anyone who's questioning why we're killing all these people, they're counter revolutionary. Like we can do this all day long until you throw the ring into the pit. Uh, it, it, so this is the Lord of the Rings was a story about how the closer you get to power, the more that all you care about is that power. Your principles go away, your beliefs go away, your values go away, your end goal for for a, you know for a better life for yourself and others goes away. It's just that power. I need that power. Mm -hmm. I'll do anything for that power. If the power is the idea of statism, then we can't harness it. It's not going to work for us at any point. We have to cast it into the fire. We have to reject statism. We have to show people that there is a better way and it's respecting people's individual lives and rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have to you know, obviously agree with that. Um, so someone also wants to know, uh, what are your current political ambitions? I know uh, I talked to Brian, uh, by the way, very, he's a very cool guy. So keep him yes. around, by the way. I like Brian a lot. Yeah, he's I love guy. Brian. Yeah. Um, but Brian was talking to me about, uh, he was like, okay, we took a whole year off of media. Now we're getting back on. We're trying to do as much stuff as possible. Um, that's what he told me. So I know obviously you guys are doing a lot of media stuff. Uh, in fact, after this in a bit, you have a uh, thing, uh, you have like an interview or something like that with another media that he told me about. So obviously you're doing a lot of media, but besides that, what other political ambitions are you having right now? So personal political ambitions at the moment, I have none. I haven't ruled out anything in the future. But my biggest thing right now, like I said before, uh, localized activism is where it's at, guys. Like getting, mm -hmm. cre creating a network of activists who are willing to work together on issues that we can affect right now. Not some federal thing that we don't have the wherewithal to, to affect, but citywide, countywide, even statewide issues that we can affect right now. You know, you're upset about the ATF. Great. Let's make your county or your state into a Second Amendment sanctuary and, and completely eliminate the ATF's ability to effectively enforce anything by mm -hmm. prohibiting your state and local police from cooperating with them on gun control stuff. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're upset about taxes. Great. Let's fight a tax increase. Let's push for tax reductions. You're, you're angry about the threat of future lockdowns. Great. Let's push for legislation that completely takes away your governor or your, your uh, county board or your city uh, 
uh, your mayor or city council's ability from ever being able to do a lockdown for public health reasons or anything else. You know, let's let's instead of being upset about something and talking about a future day where we can get however many hundreds or thousands of libertarians it takes to get elected more than we already have to be able to accomplish it. Let's just start working right now. You know, you mm -hmm. were talking about working within the existing party. Let's work with the existing politicians there. There are a lot of stuff we can get accomplished right now. Not everything, not even most of it, but there's a lot we can do now. And by doing that, we can give people who agree with us on this one issue or these two or three issues a buy-in. They don't have to join our party. They don't have to vote for our candidates. They don't have to call themselves the libertarian. If you agree with us on this, let's go work on this and then we'll figure the rest out later. Oh, you agree with us on this too? Great. Let's work mm -hmm. on that. Hey, by the way, we're working on this other thing. Do you agree? Oh, you want to work with it? Okay, great. We'll do that. Let's do that. And so that's my main focus right now is localized activism. And um, we're going to be doing a lot more of that this coming year. And uh, we'll see from there. I, I'm, I'm leaving it open past that. Awesome. Okay, I think we have a couple minutes more for a few more questions. Um, so this is actually a pretty good one. Um, is armed assault against the state justified? Huh. So um, defensive violence is justified <laughs> under the non-aggression principle. Now, there are many different competing theories as to whether or not uh, the using force against the state is justified. Now, obviously, something like uh, the police no knock raid your house, you don't even know if it's a cop or not. Uh, and you're just defending your home or something like that. Or mm -hmm. if a police officer comes up and puts a gun to your head and says, I'm going to kill you or something, something like that, uh, then obviously that's just defensive force. It didn't matter if they were with the state or not. You have a right to defend yourself. Uh, if you're talking about, you know, essentially non-immediate defensive force against the state, right. but the very existence of the state is inherently an act of aggression. Uh, they're robbing us. They are threatening us. They are kidnapping our loved ones, you know, and so then under that, you know, theory, uh, then uh, uh, defensive uh, force, any force against the state is inherently defensive. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that there are many different interesting schools of thought on this. What's more important is, to me anyway, is what's going to be effective. So in theory, uh, you could argue using, you know, many uh, different schools of thought on, on, you know, what is defensive force, that any defensive force against the state is, uh, is morally justified because it is inherently defensive. Okay, great. Do you think it's a good idea to engage in uh, uh, violent action against the state whenever you have an opportunity to, to do so? Because if that's the case, I'd have to disagree with you. I would say, I'm not saying you do. I'm just saying if, if someone did do that, so did, did believe that, I would disagree. I think that we've seen uh, reflexively the vast majority of people see violence, especially against law enforcement, but violence uh, against politicians and law enforcement that is uh, not at least uh, seemingly defensive uh, as being wrong. And mm -hmm. you're turning people against you in, in, in doing it. Uh, and they'll be also probably die and uh and or be thrown in prison and you know so so will your loved ones um so i i think that past the there's two questions there and i i certainly empathize uh with those who would argue that any uh, any force against the state can be justified i also think more often than not uh with the exception of that immediate defense of self or others um that most violence against the state is stupid um if you look against uh, or, or at least a bad strategy. Um, you know, most uh, massive violent revolt against the state results in the creation of a government that was worse than it because th than the one it replaced because their mindset is not on changing minds and changing culture. Their mindset is on right. killing anyone who gets in the way of their freedom, which mm -hmm. eventually becomes killing anyone who gets in the way of their power because now mm -hmm. they're the ones in charge. So I just, I think both short term and long term, it's it's not a good strategy. Uh, but I certainly uh, I, I can certainly empathize with the school of thought that that there is no such thing as as offensive violence against the state. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and I, I and I can take one more. Yeah, I can yeah. take one more. And then I really got to hop off because I, I got a four o'clock that yeah. starts like right at four. All right. Um, OK, I think I think this is a good one. Um, and this is the last one actually in the uh, questions one. So oh, okay. what is the best way to fight against market manipulation done by foreign government of the market past just de deregulation of our domestic market? 
that was kind of worded interestingly. You want me to uh, repeat yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, repeat it one more time. I think I, I get the gist of it, but if you want to repeat right, so, it one more time. Uh, he wants to know what is the best way to fight against the market manipulation done by foreign government of the market pass. Okay, so basically what he just wants to know how do we stop uh, other governments from manipulating our own market as opposed to just deregulating our own markets? So I, I would assume he's ref that he or she or whoever uh, put this is referring to, for example, how the Chinese government is laying down heavily on, uh, you know, on, on people in other countries yeah. who criticize them, not by threatening them directly, but by threatening who they work for that could threaten their relationships inside of, of Chinese, uh, China's government. Um, the quickest way to uh, effectively stop that is to is to create within the states and within the the non within the developed world within the, the I guess the free world for lack of a better word uh, or freer world uh, a a counter threat of if you don't allow people to speak the truth about what's happening in these dictatorial regimes overseas then we're going to boycott you mm -hmm. um, that's the that's the quickest one from a non policy standpoint from mm -hmm. a policy standpoint. The second that it becomes better to do business here than over there, that threat doesn't matter anymore, or it doesn't matter nearly as much anymore. And right. that's where the deregulation comes in. That's when mm -hmm. no longer using our military to protect foreign shipments of good into, goods into our country comes in. That's, that's when all of that comes in, is when it's no longer, oh my gosh, if we lose our relationship with, China, with the Chinese uh, economy, access to the Chinese economy and Chinese production and Chinese supply chain, then we're screwed. Well, right. if we have a better market here, that's no longer the case. So mm -hmm. it's it's both of those things. So unfortunately, I do have to to sign off, but I really yep. do appreciate your guys. Thank time you so much. And, like uh, It was a great, I hope we can do this again. Yeah. This was awesome. I would love to. I would love to. And I appreciate you guys understanding with time. Like I have to be on. Yeah. On the, no, on you're on. If, any, hey, if anyone's watching art, if anyone has RT, tune in. I'm about to be on RT. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, I do appreciate your guys' time. Talk with Brian. We'll schedule for something in the future. Awesome. Uh, and folks, everyone who tuned in, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for your questions. And hopefully we can do this again real soon. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for coming out uh, tomorrow. We have one of these with Aim and Bundy. So be sure to be there for that. <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> yeah, Double header. <laughs> back to back. All right.